Well, I have just after 12, and I know many people are rejoining as we get started or just after 12, but I think we should just jump in, and I know time's precious, and I just want to take this time to, to welcome everyone. It is a completely stunning day out there, and all the more reason to thank everyone for joining the Health Research, Health Services and Policy Research Institute Inside Research Series. Um, for those I haven't met, I'm Catherine Donnelly and, and the Director of the Institute. And so if you're joining for the first time, we are a network of health services and policy researchers and trainees. And if you'd like to join our distribution list of events or engage in the Institute, please connect with myself or Sherry Scanlon afterwards. Um, today, we are absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Jane Philpott as our new, new Dean at the Faculty of Health Sciences and Director of the School of Medicine here today to speak to us on health data. Dr. Philpott, as many of you and all of you know, I'm sure, is a family physician and served as the Chief of Medicine at Markham Stovall Hospital, an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Philpott has held senior cabinet positions with the Government of Canada, including the Federal Minister of Health and Minister of Indigenous Services. And as you know, she was recently appointed to the Minister's Special Advisory for the Ontario Health Data Platform. And we are so excited to have a strong ally and support related to health data and health research here at Queen's. Um, if people want to put comments on, I'll be monitoring the chat room and I hand the floor over to you, Dr. Philpott. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. And it's really nice to see everybody, see uh, lots of familiar names and a bunch of, that I, of you that I have not yet had a chance to meet. Uh, and of course, very few of you that I've had a chance to meet in person, but uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, session. And as Catherine says, um, I'm uh, not uh, so much necessarily a, um, a, an expert in health data, but it's a big interest of mine. But I am a huge, uh, have a huge interest in health uh, services and health policy. So um, history is a, is a place where uh, I hope I will be able to make myself at home because I think the work that you're all doing together is, is fantastic. And I'm thrilled to see uh, the way that Catherine has, has taken on her new role uh, with enthusiasm and the future is bright for those of you who are uh, health policy geeks. So uh, it's great to great to be together. And uh, Catherine gave me a fair bit of leeway. And sometimes when I get leeway, I uh, pick topics that are not necessarily my strongest because it helps to give me a chance to sort of start to think through some things. And so um, I chose for my talk today, the future of health data. And it's a bit of a scary thing to venture into when there are probably many people on the call who have a lot more uh, expertise in this area than I. Um, but uh, I'm hoping to share some thoughts with you that uh, will be uh, helpful. And let me just see here if I can actually get my slides rolling. There we go. You with, you get, you're seeing my slide there all right? Okay, good. So um, it's going to be a little bit of a, we'll call it a bit of a potpourri around uh, the future of health data based on some interesting insights that I've had um, partly just even in the last number of months. Um, so I'm going to touch on a bunch of themes and hopefully you will find yourself in some of these themes depending on, uh, on where you, uh, what, what your particular expertise and interests are. Um, the, the Health Services Policy Research Institute by definition I think brings together people from pretty broad spheres of interest and we kind of meet at the intersection of some of these themes uh, around data and, uh, and collaboration and technology. So um, hopefully there'll be a little bit of something for everyone. I'm going to start by talking a bit about health data in the context of COVID and some of my own observations and I will look forward, I'll try not to talk too long so that you can kind of save up some questions and thoughts and uh, provide some feedback as to uh, whether or not my view of what's been happening resonates with what you've seen uh, or otherwise. I thought I would secondly talk a little bit about the Ontario Health Data Platform, and I know some of you are very familiar with it. In fact, some of you may have already uh, had a chance to dabble in uh, the Queen's side of that. Um, but for those who are not familiar with what's been happening, I'll give a little bit of a high level overview there. Um, and then just finally ending off with a few thoughts on the implications around the future of health data, the direction that we're taking and how it should infuse both health services and health policy for the future. So. I hope that sounds like a reasonable approach. 
So let's look at this first thing around uh, the pandemic and what we've all noticed. And, um, you know, a tragedy brings out, obviously, um, uh, by definition, many awful things that have happened in the, in the uh, in light of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But also there are opportunities that have been brought to light in the world of both digital health and health data. And I think those uh, have been really interesting to observe. Um, it's no secret that we're all impressed with ourselves and the fact that uh, people have been able to adapt uh, at a much faster pace than we ever expected to virtual care. Um, although I would argue that, you know, our, our definition of virtual care is, is perhaps not what we would have exactly envisioned it to be. And I think there's still lots of conversations to be had about who's being left behind in the world of virtual care. And we're um, all starting to think about what the what the updated normal is going to look like in that context. The other thing that's been really interesting is that, you know, suddenly everybody's an amateur epidemiologist, uh, particularly those of you who are on social media notice that. Uh, but, you know, the good news is that people are thinking about epidemiology and, uh, and learning about epidemiological terms uh, in a way that has sort of entered the, uh, uh, the everyman's lingo. Uh, people are talking about what modeling is and data visualization. Uh, I think it has launched uh, the pandemic has, has spurred on uh, areas of innovation that might not have happened otherwise. The work towards the launch of the Ontario Health Data Platform was stuff that the province had been looking at for years uh, and had sort of done the groundwork and the way things always happen in government is that things rumble along uh, and then suddenly it lurches forward when there's a political appetite for uh, bringing it to the forefront and so uh, the OHDP I think has benefited in that sense from being brought forward out of the um, out of the drafting uh, files of, of, of uh, uh, provincial bureaucrats. So, uh, and then even things like the fact that uh, the Ontario Health team here, I think uh, it's safe to say, based on my relative newcomer status, that the fact that this current version of the uh, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington Ontario Health team has been successful um, is in part because uh, the hospital and primary care providers and community service providers um, were forced to work together through the pandemic and have therefore then really put forth a fantastic Ontario Health Team uh, application, which was, was accepted. So the pandemic has helped us in that, and that in turn will help on the world of health data, I think, in ways that we'll talk about going forward. Um, and of course, there's lots more uh, about health data that, that uh, we can enable at this time, uh, and we could chat about what some of those other things are. On the other hand, uh, the pandemic has exposed the worst of what we do and uh, what we have as it relates to health data and uh, the horrible fragmentation that we all were aware of, uh, but those fault lines have really had uh, tragic consequences in some cases. Um, people like, I see David Walker here, and he, uh, he and I have often uh, shared the sentiments around the weak public health legislation that exists, um, both provincial and federally and one could argue also uh, regionally and municipally um, and I'm happy to chat about that at greater length if people are interested but uh, really ins insufficient investments uh, you know at the time uh, that the pandemic hit I think the the uh, overall budget of the Public Health Agency of Canada was something in the order of 600 million dollars um, which sounds like a heck of a lot of money, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to how much we've spent in the last year. And one, are, one would wonder whether or not um, we'd be in better shape had we spent twice that much over a number of years. But also as it relates to health data, this really tragic reality that, that we don't collaborate very well on health data, or nor do we standardize our reporting. And so you see that happening in terms of the fact that there is no legal requirement for provinces to share data with the federal government. Um, I bumped into this problem when I was Minister of Health and we were trying to get data in a timely way around opioid overdoses. Uh, and there's, there's literally no mechanism to do that at the moment. Uh, but then we see the same kind of thing being repeated at the provincial regional level where we've got 34 public health units in Ontario that are all kind of doing their own thing in terms of what they're reporting, how they're reporting it, and it's making it a real challenge for people to be able to try and get a cohesive picture um, of, of real-time standardized data 
modeling and visualization. And the thing, one of the things I found really interesting to watch is that, you know, academics have really stepped in, which is fantastic, um, are kind of building their public profile on the fact that they are actually doing stuff that one would have thought governments might have been able to do sooner. Um, and even journalists, you know, we've seen people that were not health journalists before sort of stepping up and being curious and exploring methods of data visualization, which has been, I think, a kind of an interesting phenomenon. But if you look at COVID-19, I think just the actual COVID-19 test itself is an amazing example of, um, of how uh, poorly we are served by the silos that we all know exist within health systems. And so if you look at uh, one single case of COVID-19 and think about all the places where a person deposits little bits of their data story um, all the way through their journey from the time that they go online and use a self-assessment tool and start to document what some of their symptoms are. And for the most part, that's not being captured except for a few regions uh, that I'm aware of who are trying to figure out ways to capture uh, what's going on on their local self-assessment tool um, sometimes people are going into primary care offices where we have this massive, wonderful collection of, of information about people that doesn't generally get shared beyond the primary care office. COVID assessment centers are again capturing information. We've got the whole lab test world and the public health world. And I really, um, as some of you know, I in the early stages of the pandemic uh, when um, before I was uh, came here as Dean, I worked in a COVID assessment center and then ended up working in a really uh, bad outbreak at a group home in Markham. And at the time I did a little bit of reflection or as I was watching the frustrating pace of data moving through the system and trying to understand what was going on. And I experimented a little bit with trying to actually follow uh, what happened with a piece of with a, with a person's data and try to figure out how many databases a person's health information goes into and out of in its journey through uh, through the possibility of having COVID and possibly being hospitalized and their outcomes. And this slide, which looks a little bit dizzying, um, is actually a, a snapshot of uh, a bigger piece that I did as a, as a uh, self-study exercise to kind of look at the multiple databases that don't actually connect. And it allows us to imagine what would happen if we actually had a way that all of these pieces of health data actually do connect and that they were streamed and followed through the system so that we could look for gaps and where um, where results don't uh, uh, get reported and or when there's no follow-through as to uh, what happens when when a person's test is positive so that I won't go through this in a lot of detail but I hope it gives you the image and the realization of the fact that from the time you think that you might have COVID till the time that you are found to be positive with COVID and or back in the hospital and or uh, succumb to your infection, um, you move in and out of all kinds of disconnected databases. Um, and the movement of that data is uh, in many cases uh, done in very old fashioned ways, including um, the descriptions that I've had from folks in public health units um, who talk about receiving literally hundreds of e-faxes in a day, and I always say, don't let the word e fool you. Uh, e-faxes actually are, are multiple PDFs that get, get, get delivered to computers that then get printed out and re-entered into public health databases. And public health units, as far as I can tell across the country, are to all sorts of varying extents establishing their own versions of electronic medical records um, and setting up uh, entirely different um, uh, sets of data. So how the heck are we gonna ever get ourselves out of this mess that we're in? Well, you know, there are a bunch of things, of course, uh, that I think, I think governments could be more directive about, and I've shared some of these views with the provincial government, not that it's necessarily yet made a difference, but um, I think there's an interesting argument around the whole concept of can, can governments outlaw fax machines, for example. Some of you may follow, have followed what's happening in the UK where they, they grandly made an announcement in 2018, I think that they were going to outlaw faxes within the NHS. And uh, as far as I can tell, they, they got fairly far along. Some reports say about 60% of fax machines uh, have sort of been, been uh, abandoned, um, but COVID hit. Uh, and while their goal was to be faxless by 2020, um, I gather they have not hit that. But, um, you know, I think there's an argument to be made that when people know that they have to try to come up with other solutions, they will do better. And I 
personally have the bias that governments should be more directive and declare that uh, that healthcare faxes should be outlawed by X date in the future. Fax free by 23, uh, for example. Anyway, other things I think that could make a difference um, that where I think, uh, you know, I, I, I throw these kinds of things up anytime I get a chance to talk about health data, just because I hope someday that these will be a reality. Um, I think we're closer on the single digital identifier for health. Um, although, um, you know, and some people, of course, we, generally use the OHIP number in Ontario, but as you uh, no doubt know, there are lots of places where your health data is captured uh, and it's collected according to, for instance, a medical record number in a hospital. Hospital me medical record numbers have a tremendous amount of overlap with people having multiple identities within the same hospital system. So we've got a, got a ways to go on that. Um, and I have a very, very strong bias toward a future uh, where we will see one patient, one health record. And I think that uh, will be a great day to celebrate. I, I uh, enthusiastically believe that it's possible and it's certainly in people's inter best interests. But we have a lot of... Um, a lot of pieces that have to come together for that to be possible. And this slide is just a, you know, a snapshot of the kind of places as to, to what it would look like to be in a world of one health record um, and uh, how we could, could share that together. But uh, certainly from experiences that I've had with uh, being able to share records between uh, primary care and community care uh, and paramedicine, for example, it's a, it's a pretty phenomenal experience for both patients and providers. So let me move on to a slightly different topic and just give you a little bit of a snapshot uh, about the Ontario Health Data Platform. Uh, so hopefully most of you have heard at least a little bit of wind of this, especially since it's, there's a, a very big Queen's feature to the story. Uh, but uh, it was announced about the middle of April that the province was going to launch a data platform. Its initial version was called Panther, um, and that stood for Pandemic Threat Response. Uh, they fairly quickly dropped the name in part uh, because they realized that if they were going to go to all this work to put together uh, the largest health database in the country that they uh, that it should that amount of work should outlive uh, the pandemic and uh, it was also determined that Panther is apparently uh, an acronym for some kind of CIA database and they didn't want to be uh, confused with that one. So at the moment it has the very unimaginative name of the Ontario Health Data Platform um, and if you haven't explored it yet I encourage you to go to the Compute Ontario site and the website is, is captured up there to just experiment uh, a little bit around. The, the OHDP is sort of the biggest thing at, at, at the Compute Ontario site so you won't have trouble finding it there. Um, but what it is is essentially uh, bringing together uh, of a computing environment to, uh, to be able to uh, compile uh, large health data sets and allow for for advanced uh, computing with uh, big data analytics for AI and machine learning um, that is, was initially envisioned as a COVID response, but obviously will go well beyond that um, with the goal to uh, both scale and spread our, uh, the timeliness of research, uh, as well as, as I said, using advanced research methods and be able to do so in a way that protects uh, the privacy, privacy and security of the data. Um, and uh, some of you uh, will have seen this slide before perhaps because I think uh, Amber Simpson did some rounds for you guys not so long ago that was on a sim similar topic but just for the sake of those who haven't seen this yet. Um, I, I actually think when, the, when this first dis discussion first happened, I'm not sure to what extent everybody kind of understood that what the government was describing was actually pretty similar to what we already had in, in the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. Um, and so there were questions about how ICES was going to kind of fit in with the OHDP. And I actually think that the, the end uh, point, well, it's not the end point because this is an iterative process, but the current uh, vision is, uh, is a nice resolution of, of respecting the fantastic success and institutional knowledge that ICES has built up in terms of how you uh, collate health data effectively and how you provide access to researchers. But then by adding the OHDPQ, which is the Queen site, 
um, is allowing a bunch of new opportunities. One is, of course, using the uh, um, computing power, which is, uh, you know, an order of magnitude greater that we have access to here on the uh, Center for Ex Advanced Computing in Queens, uh, but also starting to look more towards using some of the authorities within PHIPAA legislation that um, that are actually available also under ICES, although ICES from my understanding, and I know there are ICS researchers on the line here, so you can correct me if, my, if I'm wrong, but has generally used the authorities within the concept of the prescribed entity as the mechanism by which uh, that personal health information can be available to researchers. Um, and using the Section 44 of PHIPAA legislation, um, which is now available across the OHDP, um, will allow the concept of a trusted researcher to be able to access these databases um, uh, as long as they provide either institutional uh, REB approvals and or there will be mechanisms to use Public Health Ontario um, REB approvals to be able to access the Queen site. But um, it's a really exciting project, is literally about to launch uh, almost any minute or any day now at the Queen site. I, I haven't had a, an update in the last couple of days, but um, the final sign off of all of the pieces around security and privacy are almost there. But the, the concept of the OHDP did launch in July at the ICES site and there are something in the order of 30 or 40 projects using the platform now. Um, and definitely uh, some Queens ones that are underway or lined up and I strongly encourage you if you're interested in being able to uh, uh, access this data that um, there are still some bugs being ironed out, as you may have heard about along the way in terms of, of what it means to be able to get access to the platform, but I think uh, uh, considering how quickly this has all come together and with the uh, legitimate anxieties around making sure that um, all of the uh, right uh, security mechanisms are in place. It's, it's happened pretty quickly. So uh, the province um, has, is trying to, in the early days, focus on a number of research priorities which have been set by the uh, secretariat within uh, uh, the OHDP um, steering committee. Uh, so these are some of the priorities that they have set and they have sort of said early access to data will be for people who are studying issues related to some of these topics. You might have noticed in last week's budget that there was a bit of extra money thrown in. I think it was just in the order of a couple of million dollars, but um, some of us have been encouraging uh, the province to suggest that if they really are serious about trying to get answers to questions, uh, priority questions that resourcing researchers who want to access the platform in addition to providing access um, will uh, benefit uh, or, or make it more likely that people will be able to answer some of those important questions uh, early on. Uh, so what do all these things mean about, you know, some of these issues around the future of, of health data for the work we do and uh, that you do in health services and health policy? Um, I think it's, we are really well situated here at Queen's to have a very uh, lively conversation uh, about uh, the impacts of modern health data analytics uh, in, in the context of what we teach, uh, how we provide care and how we research. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm interested in learning from you and having further discussions as to whether or not we're actually teaching uh, health professionals uh, and health scientists in a way that reflects the kinds of skill sets that they need to have, the competencies that that future health professionals uh, and health researchers will need to have to be able to, to function. Uh, as, as far as I can tell, I think we've got still a long way to go and there's uh, there's increasing interest around sort of micro-credentialing people in terms of uh, being able to have uh, greater um, uh, abilities in terms of, uh, of negotiating a, a, a health data future that's very different from what it's been in the past. Um, I was over at the um, clinical 
I always get confused between the clinical education center and the clinical teaching center, but I was in both of them recently. And um, I just, I was the, me the wonderful medical student that was showing me through, I said to him, so when you're doing your uh, clinical um, uh, visits here um, with standardized patients or voluntary patients, I said, are, where, how are you taking your notes? Um, and at first, I think he was a bit confused by the question, but he said, well, we just take the notes on a piece of paper. And I said, isn't it interesting that in the year 2020, we're still actually teaching our students um, without a computer in the room where, where they're actually doing their clinical placements? And are we actually teaching uh, in a way that is acknowledging the kind of uh, um, opportunities that data provides for the evaluation of a patient, um, but also looking at what it looks like to have those individual clinical visits um, in a world that is um, entire, entirely digitized. Um, and of course, how we discover, I think the opportunities for us here at Queen's are enormous with a theme, uh, not themes around not only health systems as all of you are focused on, but an incredible opportunity of uh, themes around uh, uh, big data and AI uh, and infusing that in everything that we do because we've got uh, some of the, the best uh, advanced computing facilities in the country right here in this city um, and we should absolutely be taking advantage of them and as I say um, increasing our digital literacy along the way um, you know people like me who uh, have uh, ventured uh, only dabbled my feet in the water of the of the world of coding have um, have uh, I think some anxieties around what it's what our digital literacy levels need to be like to be able to be part of of uh, the future of, of health discovery but I think uh, again real opportunities for us to be able to be in the forefront of of um, improving uh, the digital literacy of, of everyone in the health sciences. Um, a few other th opportunities I just wanted to touch on very briefly because I think that they're really interesting for us. Um, and one of them I just wanted to again draw your attention to for those of you who haven't been following closely, but we have been approved here at, at, in the Frontenac, Lennox and adding Frontenac. Lennox and Addington uh, regions uh, to have a new brand new uh, Ontario health team. Um, I've stolen these pictures from some Australian literature that Mike Green pointed me to, which I think is really fascinating, but it kind of gives you a little flavor of the model of, of what we're going to be looking at in the in the FLA Ontario health team um, and how that's really going to open up a great opportunity for us uh, to be able to uh, use health data well and it actually um, coincides with a time where uh, there's a new hospital information system coming available um, and finding ways that we can uh, be able to link people uh, both uh, figuratively, literally, and digitally. And, you know, I think uh, the Faculty of Health Sciences really uh, is already and will continue to be a hub of excellence uh, for health data and health systems with Health Services Policy Research Institute right there leading the way. And uh, you always, uh, I'm sure I've left out all kinds of other people's favorite places and centers and institutes. So you please see yourself in the place of others there. Uh, but I know there's really terrific work being done in all kinds of great places around uh, the Queen's community. And uh, I think we should take advantage of it. And uh, don't, you know, $250 million that, that uh, UFT got to think that they're gonna be the AI and health place for the future. Well, they, they're gonna have a run for their money. Uh, and we're gonna show them that uh, we can do just as well here because we got really smart people that care. So um, with that, I will uh, stop sharing and uh, hear what questions and thoughts are on your mind. Great, thanks, Jen. You've laid the gauntlet down now. We can beat 250. <laughs> You've raised so many issues that I deeply resonate with me as well. You know, just thinking this, you know, the dream of the common EMR um, and, you know, thinking about data on the front lines and, and in education, I, I think particularly our students, we don't see that as integrated as much into our education. I know that I could ask you a million questions, but I know that all the people on the, the, the call right now have a, a million as well. So I'm going to open up the floor here. So I'm, I will monitor the chat, but if you would like to also um, just unmute yourselves and, and feel free to ans ask any questions.
who do people are feeling shy. <laughs> There's Walter. Uh, a little louder if possible. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Coming along. There we go. We can't hear you, sorry. I, can you hear? No, I, I, sorry, Walter, we so, can't hear you. Now you can hear me fine. Now we can hear you. Yeah, sorry. Um, my question for you, uh, I think my connection is still stuck on a Teams meeting from the previous hour. Uh, is it, as you build the data, data center, and I'm like so enthused, and you know we have a project that's in there uh, at, at the leading edge. Um, but um, you talk also about your uh, Ontario Health team, and you probably know I'm heavily involved in Ontario Health teams. Um, but it's have you thought about the way that the health data center um, is used in ways that will benefit? The health system um, and the interactions of you know questions that might you know your OHT might have or others might have um, around how patient care is um, evolving. Um, so beyond just the uh, research for research sake, you know, new models, new approaches to doing data, but ways that are answering um, questions in the health system. So that is a great question, Walter. I really appreciate you raising that and. Um, I, I probably, I didn't maybe for those who don't know, but uh, although maybe I think Catherine mentioned at the beginning that I, my uh, intersection with the platform um, has been as a special advisor to the Minister of Health and the president of the Treasury Board on the data platform. And when I, I have to confess, when I first heard about it, uh, I am a clinician at heart. And so my immediate thought went to all of the, the you know, frontline clinical needs and how we can actually use data better. And as I alluded to on the COVID journey, I sort of think about how, you know, if we could actually know everybody who had had a test um, and be able to kind of follow them through at the clinical interface as to what happened to them and be able to look for where there were gaps uh, or, or, or um, uh, people either hadn't had their results or we didn't, we didn't connect to what happened to them the rest of the way. And my vision initially was like, oh, that's great. That's what this Ontario Health Data Platform is going to be about. And then I was sorely disappointed in, in, in the early days because I, they, you know, they, it was very clear that it wasn't envisioned as a clinical tool. Having said that, um, I think as, one, as it gets launched um, and as it gets launched in the spirit of as close as possible to real-time data analysis um, that will answer clinical questions, I think we are going to increasingly be able to back it up um, closer and closer to real time. Maybe that's my optimism speaking again, um, but the, it's for, the first vision of the government was to see it as a tool for research and also for policy analysis. But, um, you know, I think even some of the initial work that's coming out of the, the platform um, is starting to show how, what a helpful tool it could be on the clinical uh, interface as well. Um, and it's all lining up. I mean, there's so much happening in this space. And I, again, this is, I, I'm, I'm talking like as if I know what I'm talking about, but I'm really not an expert in any of this. I'm just an enthusiast. Um, some of you are familiar with the Gemini work that's um, happening in the rest of, well, it started, I think, with a bunch of Toronto hospitals, and now it's sort of expanding across um, the uh, province and KHSC, at least. I'm not sure about Providence, but KHSC is going to be part of the Gemini platform. And uh, clinicians are starting to be able to see how the tools of Gemini, which is using hospital data to predict outcomes as to who's going to die or who's going to end up in the ICU uh, based on their admission symptoms. Um, and, and clinicians are actually then making real-time uh, changes uh, to how they treat patients based on the information that's coming out of that platform. I think that helps me envision that I think the OHDP is going to find itself increasingly drawn to be used as a, as a clinical frontline tool. And I look to people like Amber and others who I can't imagine that Amber doesn't have in her mind that the OHDP is going to have that kind of opportunity for us um, as we go forward. Certainly the lessons learned in terms of you know, 
predictors of clinical progress will be there, but to actually see it also be used, you know, from the moment a person walks through the door of the emergency room um, to be able to, to follow them, I think uh, we'll get there. Is that a question, Walter? Yeah, I think even, even not just in real time, but um, as responsive to the system. But I think, yeah, I, I gather, you know, what you're saying and uh, build it, start using it, um, bring in things of clinical value, utility like Gemini, and um, uh, then turn it around uh, and, uh, and then the demand will, will draw the future. There's a few people who've raised their hands. I just note that Amber Simpson, David Walker, and Laura Rosella, and I think Sutteray. So Amber, if you'd like to go. Thanks. And Walter asked my question. And so I will ask us a slightly different question. So Jane, you and I have thought a lot about data justice. Can you, uh, can you maybe shed some light on that for the audience? Oh boy, again, an area that uh, there are many who know a lot more about this than I, but one of the most, so just to give you guys a little bit of sort of insight as to what happens in the background, this Ontario Health Data Platform thing has been a really interesting journey with the government. So one of the things that I do in addition to um, uh, aiming to, to provide advice to the ministers is I host something called a Joint Ministers Roundtable, which is sort of a way that experts are trying to feed into uh, government to, to develop this thing. And they have then in turn developed working groups. So there's a working group on intellectual property, which is super interesting in an entire conversation in and of itself. There's a working group on, um, on uh, the data um, supply chain and data governance within the platform. But the one that's actually, I think, not developed nearly to the extent that it could is on ethics and engage, community engagement. Um, we have a long way to go on that, but Amber and I have, have indeed had some really interesting conversations because in particular, racialized communities, uh, as many of you know, are very anxious about what uh, these, uh, a platform like the OHDP uh, could do and uh, all of the efforts that those of you experts uh, do to uh, uh, de-identify data, um, it's pretty, it can still be really hard to give people confidence that there are uh, ways that data will be re-identified uh, and people will be um, um, made more increasingly vulnerable because of the sharing of their data. So it's led to some interesting conversations around what does what does it look like to potentially donate your data to the government and some jurisdictions in the, in the world that have actually tried that route around sort of um, not having and we've we don't have a mechanism at the moment for people to opt out of their data being shared um, but should we actually be either instituting that and or should we be instituting a way that people um, can opt into their data being used so um, another whole conversation and I'm really glad that it's on people's radar. I heard that the first people that asked to be involved in the platform, the first projects were from the RCMP. I don't know if that's true. I don't know that that's true. That urban man, I will find it. I will check on that. They'd have to have I mean at the moment it's only university researchers mm -hmm. using the platform. So I don't know whether the RCMP has pals at you know a university <laughs> Funny. David Walker had a question. Thank you. Um, I don't think I can be visible, but I can. I think I'm being heard. Um, thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jane. Um, I think it was Alan Rock who either said or stole the, the aphorism that you can't manage what you can't measure. So uh, the ability of this initiative to import and aggregate data is going to be critical to new intelligence. The question I have is the extent to which this initiative might work in reverse in changing the practice on the ground. We know now that during the last few months, we've had the information about COVID being entered into many systems manually. Um, until very recently, the average time between somebody testing positive or presenting to be tested and found positive to actually moving to contact tracing was about five days with some being as long as 30 days, which is ridiculous. Um, in fact, in some institutions, we've been using mail, uh, literally putting a report in the mail for Canada Post to deliver to a public health unit. 
Um, so how can this initiative, which as it gathers intelligence for the betterment of everybody, um, actually then convert back to changing practices on the ground, which are clearly critical? David, I wish I had the answer to that question. Um, could we make you the premier? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I think that it, it absolutely should be able to do that. I think the bandwidth of policymakers has been stretched pretty phenomenally. Um, and, you know, as I said, I think this has exposed the fault lines of our systems. Uh, I think we need to all continue to push for uh, the fact that it, it, sh it does not strike me as rocket science, what you're asking for, um, but the, the right people have not yet sort of seen fit that that should be their top priority right now. Um, I've had some questions, some conversations with Matt Anderson about it, because I think this is in a sense an Ontario health driven uh, initiative. Um, and some of you know that Dirk Heyer, our chief, Ontario Chief Coroner, is also involved in the testing stuff, and I think this is on his radar, uh, but I just think that they are still, um, it's always the, the, you know, the crisis of dealing with the present and not actually s carving off a few other people to say, go create what we really should be doing and let's, let's make that happen. So. It was, I mean, it is digital first, was the mantra of Ontario Health. So uh, one would hope that, and if we had digital first, then your job would be a lot easier. All of our jobs would be a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it should theoretically be quite possible. Well, Laura, thank, thank you, David. Um, Laura, you had a question. come off mute. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Philpott, for that uh, really interesting conversation. Could talk all day about data. My, my question's really about culture around data. Um, I still feel that we are, we have a culture of, it's my data, I'm giving it to you. Um, you don't know how to use it, let me teach you before you can touch it. And I, I think that the place where innovation happens is where we're multiple people with multiple expertise, and I'm sorry about my son in the background, uh, contribute to data uh, and contribute to that knowledge. So any insight now that you've kind of seen the culture in the face, how we can work on that? Um, because it's nobody's data, it's actually patient's data, uh, but there's the ownership around it. So just I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And, and don't apologize for your son. We all love that you have your son there with you. That's awesome. Those are car sounds he's making in case yeah, anyone's wondering. He's, he's being by osmosis, you know, being, uh, having ideas about health data embedded in his brain while he's listening in. So that's always good. Um, anyway, uh, I, I think we need to have a louder conversation about this with Canadians. I think, or, like you say, it's, there's, there's a lot of fear and anxiety and that's it kind of goes back to Amber's question is, you know, um, how can we talk about this in a way that people aren't instantly panicked about it? Um, and I, I really find this idea of, um, of a data donation or at least a, figuring out how we do informed consent better and start to show people the value of what happens when we let the, when we have a chance to use the data, um, I think is, is part of what we need to do better. Um, I think as the OHDP moves into its next phase, there's a, a significant appetite and I will certainly be pushing around better public engagement and sort of informing the public about the great discoveries that have already been made and could yet be made in the future. Um, so I, I think it's, it all, often comes down to communications, how you change the culture um, and, you know, getting a few of you, people like you who know what the risks are and how, and all of the steps that are taken to be able to protect people's privacy, to be able to try to translate that into lay person's language as much as possible to give people the sense that the risk benefit ratio is in the direction of, of uh, public benefit uh, and that we need to take away the fear somehow. So I think you've nailed it that there's, there's fear and anxiety, um, but 
um, there will there will always be skeptics, and I think we should maybe host a, a conversation about this somewhere together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's Thank you. Uh, Th thanks very much, Laura. Cedera, you had a question. Yeah, um, thank you for, for the um, presentation. And I'm, I'm sorry if I was late and because of that, um, I might miss some part of the information um, that would relate to my question. So my question is about, okay, we have a platform that we can use hopefully um, very soon, uh, but how much control we can have or how much power we can have in what kind of data is going to be put into that platform. And I'm asking that question because I'm a um, refugee and immigrants health researcher. And um, in Canada, one of our biggest problems is that unlike many European countries, we are not collecting data about, um, you know, country of origin, language, religion. And you know, I understand why we don't do that, but because of that, we don't know who we are serving and we don't know, uh, we are actually generalizing information and use the interventions for the general population, which might be actually harmful for our, our minorities. Um, so I, I just wanted to know if there is any, if we have, would have power in uh, deciding on what data gets put into the platform. Thanks very much. Uh, great question. And so when I first heard you going down the what data gets in, goes into the platform, it brought me to some of the conversation that's happening in the chat around what data is going to be in the OHDP. So let me just comment on that first briefly, um, just to say that one of the, you know, I think we will end up in a world where the, you know, the ICES and the Queen site will actually hopefully become more of a one big happy family <laughs> with with uh, multiple platforms. Um, but we're not quite there yet. But one of the answers that that was provided in terms of, you know, what's the difference between them is that with the larger computer computing capacity of the Center for Advanced Computing, we have an opportunity to introduce uh, larger data files, uh, including things like imaging, which is, I think, an area that lots of people are super interested in. Um, and the one piece of good news that I wanted to share, because I think this is interesting, is that I think the province has been so far really receptive to the idea of user-driven um, data sets. And, you know, I, while we're not quite there yet with imaging data sets being on the platform, we're closer to it being possible and there's absolutely a receptiveness. So the kinds of sort of data from that perspective, I think this is, we, we're entering a whole new world of. But your comments were kind of also more around the whole idea of, of race and ethnicity, et cetera, which I think is a harder thing to do. There is definitely an appetite uh, and an understanding as to what the advantages of, are, are of that, as well as the risks. Um, the government did introduce, the provincial government in Ontario did introduce um, uh, an amendment to regulations a few months back that allow this weird phenomenon where people who've had a positive COVID test that they can go back and have the authority to go back and ask people race-based questions after they've been de deemed positive. I think everybody thinks that's slightly crazy as to if we've got the authority to do that, why don't we ask people at the outset? Um, I think we we will get there by by some means. The first thing that we should do, my goodness, going back to David's question is, why the heck aren't people entering their lab requisitions online or using either a, a, a digital platform that will not allow you to proceed without answering questions that are obvious like that or at least forcing you to opt out of answering race-based questions. Um, so there are, there are obviously mechanisms by which this can be done, um, but uh, it's not quite clear how quickly we're going to get it done. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cedric. I don't know if other people, I'm just going to the chat here. Um, Sabrina. Thanks. And I'm, I think I'm an interloper. I'm not located in Ontario, but really appreciate the invitation. I am um, co-chairing the Sitson with Dave Barber. So maybe that's how I got invited. But anyways, um, a couple points. One is, um, is there a movement to move away from what we're calling 
race-based data uh, to um, trying to really understand what we collect that could be useful. So that's, as Cetera had said, ethnicity, language, immigration. It's clearly an intersection that puts uh, people at risk um, for things like COVID and then the care that happens. Um, so I would really be happy to talk more about moving away from race-based data collection to something that really is more informative that's going to help people. Um, and then the second thing is just around, I'm wondering um, if you've heard any um, news about what the other provinces are thinking and whether or not they think that this idea that's going on with the Ontario data platform might be something that they might decide to also think about doing in Canada. Um, yeah, so let me just respond uh, to both of those, Sabrina, and thanks for being here. We, we don't care how you got here, we're, we're happy you're here. So <laughs> it probably was David that invited you though. So great to know you're here and, and you know, with your insights into primary care data, you're absolutely right that there's, you know, race is just one of many pieces of information about who people are that will allow us to be able to provide better care and learn more about them. And I think primary care is the place that demonstrates that. Uh, better than anywhere. If I can have my primary care hat on for a minute. Um, I don't know that in general we've done as good a job as we could in primary care by figuring out how to capture that in ways that can, so you know the primary, the family doctor and primary care providers kind of have in their brains all kinds of incredible information about who people are that informs your clinical decisions because you, you know, you know what happened to grandma when grandma got you know, had, had this particular treatment or had this particular interaction, you know, the sister's history and all that. We haven't figured out how to kind of link that digitally in a way that can allow machines to be able to work as well as our brains do. Um, but I think it does speak to the fact that there's obviously a ton more interesting data that can be added. Um, and now I can't remember what your second part was, was on it was around um, whether there's other provinces oh, that other are provinces. watching and asking you questions or asking the ministry questions. Yeah, so I have not been, there's probably people on the line that are following it more closely, but my understanding is that, that BC um, is well on their way, if not beyond Ontario, uh, in terms of, of a similar kind of uh, platform. Uh, and there is now an, uh, a real move, again, federally to be able to try and look at a federal health data strategy. And um, Vivit Goel, uh, I think, is, uh, is one of the people that has been tasked with uh, trying to put together that fe federal health data platform. And, you know, obviously we think that that would, you know, be really advantageous. But let me tell you, the world of federal provincial data is another whole story. Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks for joining us from Vancouver today. Yeah, there's a number of different comments in the chat and I know Anna Johnson had had a question who's online and then I'm gonna go and, and pull a few of the comments from the chat after. Anna. Thank you, Catherine. Wonderful to hear uh, some of your presentation, uh, Jane, just because I had to come in later at another meeting. Um, just really wonderful to hear you speak. It's my first time, actually, so it's my, my, my honor to hear you. Um, I just I wanted to follow up on that comment on the proprietariness of the data. You know how researchers as a whole tend to view data as this is my data and nobody gets to play, but if you, you, you play, I'll let you, you know, share maybe. Um, I wonder if this is, is really, really comes from the incentives, you know, we have as researchers uh, because, right, we have the publish or perish incentive and, you know, so sort of the idea people think is if I share my work, then, you know, how am I going to publish more than somebody else? Um, and, and I know it's, it's not great. It, I know there's enough to go around for everybody, uh, but I know that that is not um, something that is, you know, thought of. There's a little competition in a way. Um, so so I, I wanted to hear your thoughts about that, given also your, your position and your role uh, and, and power. And, uh, and my second question is more general, is in terms of the, the data platform itself. It's very exciting. Um, and 
when is it available for us all to use? Because I know the last time I heard a presentation, maybe this was said earlier and I missed it, but it was only at a pilot stage and only a few people who are sort of in the group can use it. And so I was wondering when it's actually going to be available. Uh, so let me answer that one first, because it's easier. <laughs> And, and we're, we are going to run out of time, and unfortunately, but uh, hopefully we can pick up this conversation. Um, if you go on the computeontario.ca website, you'll immediately see Ontario Health Data Platform and certainly reach out um, to folks like Catherine or Amber or others if you're uh, struggling to figure out uh, where to take the next steps. But um, there are opportunities within that and links to how to apply to be able to use the data. And as some of our colleagues will be able to tell you, it has not been a seamless process yet. I think it is getting better. Um, and uh, even though the Queen site is only just about to launch, um, researchers can use the ICES site and have been doing some uh, um, AI type projects on that site and there's an opportunity to indicate that as soon as the Queen site becomes available that will allow um, both more data and a higher processing power that people will be able to shift their projects into the Queen site. So um, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, Steve Smith, who's our Vice Dean for Research, is also really happy to help you with that too. Was somebody trying to jump in there? I just there is like you had mentioned Jane there's a ton of different questions and I think this really raises an, an important issue there's so many topics that that we've touched on today and I think this is going to have to be a start of a conversation that we have regularly um, I just have one final comment and this is probably an enormous one to say uh, Mulligetta from the School of Rehab just to build on Sabrina's comments about cross Canada his comment comes from an Ethiopian perspective and just thoughts on, on countries that may not have the infrastructure and recommendations for researchers and policymakers in more developing countries such as Ethiopia. Wow, there is a really big and interesting question. I think that, you know, because we have this lovely uh, partnership uh, that exists in, to various extents between um, some academic institutions in Ethiopia uh, and in here at Queen's and elsewhere in, in Canada, um, I think there are some real opportunities to be able to support development in this area. And obviously there are lots of industry partners who might be interested in supporting some of that work as well. So um, I would say, Mulligata, that we should uh, have a conversation and the Health Services Policy Research Institute might be a good place to, to do that, to say, um, you know, what else can be done? I, I know, you know, uh, uh, electronic health records and electronic medical records are obviously available to varying extents in sub-Saharan African countries, but uh, it would be really interesting to partner together on projects like that. Great. Well, I'm going to leave it at that. I know there's a, a slew of other um, comments in the chat and I'll make sure that I follow up with everybody and, and Jane, I'll connect with you about some of those comments too. I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us today and, and speaking. Clearly, there's a, a huge appetite and interest for this conversation. So we will, Amber had joined us um, earlier in the fall and we'll make sure we have an effort to, to have regular conversations with regards to particularly the ODHP and, and data use. So Thank you very much and thank you to everybody and uh, head out to enjoy that beautiful day. <laughs> My pleasure. Great to see you. Bye.